Welcome to the Niche Pursuits Podcast. Are you ready to discover some niche business ideas that actually work? Well, it's time for a motivational kick to jumpstart your next big idea. Here's your host, Spencer Haas. Hey, everybody. This is Parent for Niche Site Project 3.0, and we're on call number seven of our amazing project. And I think... We are getting pretty close to being able to reveal the site, so that's pretty exciting. But I'm happy to be here, and uh, as always, I have my mentee, Colleen Kenzie. Colleen, how's it going? It's going great. Excited to be here, as always. Yeah, and you aren't working right now, right? It's like 2 p.m. where I am. I know. Well, it's 2 p.m. where I'm at, too. I'm taking a little breather from work so I can crank out some more articles for my site and, uh, and sending in the big termination letter on Thursday. So I'm pretty excited. Yeah. Have we talked about that on a call yet? Um, I don't think so. I don't think we have yet. Why don't you tell people what's going on? <laughs> okay. So a couple months ago, I kind of realized that my, I wasn't happy with the direction that my life was going, and um, I decided that I was going to save up as much money as possible and backpack throughout the year, throughout the world. So I've been selling all my stuff, and I got really lucky that I got this mentorship with for NSP 3.0 because it kind of fit into my plans really well. And so I'm not making money from my site yet. But I have a lot in savings, and I'm kind of trying to pursue other ways of life and see what makes me happy, kind of screwing the cube, if you will. Yeah, I like it. And you were going to do this whether or not you got into NSP 3.0, right? Yep, that's correct. But this was definitely an added bonus, kind of telling me that I'm going in the right direction. So I feel like it was meant to be. Cool, man. Well, I'm happy for you. That should be exciting. I didn't know you were going to send it in uh, that soon. Do you know when your last day will probably be? Yeah, um, I have it all planned out. So I have a flight to Dublin on March 21st. So 321 is oh, wow. my is the But um, I'll probably work up until that last Friday. But I kind of feel like once I put my notice in on Thursday, which is in two days, I probably won't work too hard. <laughs> they know I'm on my way out the door, right? So they can't have too high of expectations. For sure. Well, cool. That should be super fun. And I think it's really awesome. And pursuing that sort of lifestyle is really cool. And I think it's something that people should do for themselves, whether or not they're into site building. So uh, congrats on that. Yeah. I think it's a cool life change. So let's get into it. As you can probably see on the screen, this call is going to be about outreach. We talked a little bit about it in, in our last call. But today we're going to get into some more tactics about how to execute your first outreach campaign because we're almost there and we've talked about why it's important. We talked about why you need links. We talked about where we are going to try to get them first in our last call, but we really didn't talk about how exactly to do it. Um, and that's probably the most important part because otherwise you can't do it. So we're going to talk about that in this call and hopefully send you guys away with some stuff that you can do for your own sites. Uh, first, though, let's uh, get a confession out of you, Colleen. I know that you were almost, that we were talking a big game last time about being done with content, but that didn't happen, right? So where are we at? Right. So I am a little bit behind on my content, but I'm going to try to get it done this week. I'm so close to the finish line, but... You know, insert excuse X, Y, Z about last week. I was really busy. But um, I've been trying to crank them out. Uh, I did about six this weekend, so that's good. I'm getting back on track, but I know that I'm only holding myself up. So I'm waiting for my friend to finish up his articles that I assigned him. That's about seven, and um, I think I have about six or seven to do myself. Cool. Yeah, and really... Once you get yours, then you can go ahead and start posting, right? So, uh, I'm sorry. You could start trying to build some links and send some emails because right. you can post the other ones anytime. But that's fine, you know? Even though I'm super mad and I thought about stopping the project, we've decided to keep going. 
And Worst mentee ever. <laughs> Worst mentee ever. No, it's fine. That stuff happens. We are already ahead of schedule content wise. So we're just trying to get it done and get the site to a point where we can really send some emails. So being a few days behind really doesn't hurt. And I think we're still on a really good schedule. Um, so we've got that going. We're going to try to get that finished this week. I figured since I often just ramble and talk a whole bunch on these things that it would be cool for the readers and the listeners to hear a little bit more from Colleen and um, start with some Q&A about the link building process. So you've had like a week to think about it. Um, You've tried a little bit of the link prospecting and you've had some results. So maybe first, just tell us what you have tried from the last assignment, um, which is actually cool because you didn't really need to do the assignment because um, the content was still kind of holding you up or holding the schedule up anyway. Um, so you could have put it on hold, but you went ahead and tried some of it. And I'd like to know how it went and what you tried and what you thought about it. Well, I had to get something for our listeners to listen to this week, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So basically my process was I kind of started with a lot of the sites that I've been using as reference sites that I've been using to write and to kind of look at content. So I kind of started there and I looked at some of the sites that they're refer- referencing to and just did kind of a lot of Google searches. I found, you know, I started with the top 50 blogs for this and just kind of went all over the board. And I think that that's where I came with questions because I know that you're going to have criteria instead of just every site under the sun. So sure, yeah. should I so, go ahead and start with my question? Um, or do well, you want to? Let's take like two steps back. So, I think really the tactics that you've been sort of just putting the feelers out for are asking your friends and finding 50 top blogs, right? Oh, right. Yeah. So let's maybe take those one at a time. So asking your friends, what have you done and how did it work and how do you feel about it? Gotcha. Okay. So a couple hours ago, I messaged Karen and I'm like, I don't have any friends with blogs. (laughs) But I found three not 10, and the third is my sister's friend's mom who has a scrapbooking blog, which I don't think will work. <laughs> so I was really reaching deep, and um, Karen had a couple good suggestions, which I've been working on this afternoon, and that was to just do a post on Facebook, and I asked if anyone had any cool blogs, because it kind of works well, because everyone is really happy to share their links, and... Mm-hmm. They want to get their name out there, too. So then I kind of figure that once I get those links, I can start private messaging them and kind of see if maybe we could do a guest post. Mm -hmm. And did you get any responses? um, um, I got a couple. One is a farming blog, and another is a speech pathology blog. Cool, yeah. So, um, and I... We we talked about this a little bit before, but so we've got some some quote unquote weird blogs. We've got a scrapbooking blog, a farming blog, a speech pathology blog. Just because they're different doesn't mean we can't guess, can't guest post on them. We just have to find some way to overlap our market with their market, right? So for example, if we had a fitness blog, it'd be pretty easy to talk about the benefits of like a fitness scrapbook. Right. You know, like you can make those up or you could find out some really good information about it and sort of manufacture those pros and cons, because it is a cool idea, maybe to have like a fitness scrapbook instead of a fitness journal. If you're a more visual person and then like if you want to create graphs and stuff, I know when I'm trying to get fit, I create like Excel graphs and pie charts and that sort of thing, because it's just motivating for me. Or maybe if you had a country music blog. Um, you might be able to write about the benefits of singing in speech therapy, right? And you could post that on a speech, a a speech pathology blog. So you can guest post pretty much anywhere. You just have to figure out where your market overlaps with other markets or just create that overlap yourself. So I think that's good. And 
you started with three people who you know who had blogs, and you found a couple more. So even if we don't have ten, we've got five links, and that's really strong. Uh, every link is good, and links are hard to get. So getting five is uh, pretty awesome, and all it took was one Facebook post and a couple of private messages, right? So that's about as easy yeah. as, as, as those links get. What did we talk about when you messaged me first? Because you t- you said to me what a, what most people say to me, which is I don't know anybody who has blogs. And then where did the conversation go from there? I think you said think outside of your mom. <laughs> Yeah. To quote you, if you will. Pretty much, yeah. And what do you think that means? And, like, what can people learn from it? So I think that means that you can reach outside of your direct network, and there may be people under the wood that have blogs, and it's best to just find a way, you know, reach out and talk to people that know somebody or, you know, use your social networks, too. Yeah, totally. And also... um Putting the bait out there instead of necessarily just like thinking about friends and asking the people who you know already have blogs. Sometimes you have to message people or I mean or put a post out there for other people to respond to um, because there are some people who you might know uh, who you don't know that they have a blog or someone might have a friend who has a blog and you can just ask for that stuff and you might get a lot more responses. Um, we also had a strategy that spawned off of this, right? So if, if you feel like your social network has been tapped out and you no longer have any opportunities or friends who have blogs, we, we sort of morphed this strategy into something else using Facebook in the same way. Uh, why don't you tell people what we came up with? Yeah, so what I did is I tried to um, start joining communities on my topic and started kind of feeling out the audience and seeing if they had any blogs or if they had any cool links to suggest and then private messaging them. Um, One thing that I did, I found one lady's blog and I private messaged her and just said, hey, I really like your blog. I can't stop reading it and, you know, gave her a little flattery, and she private messaged me back. So excited to see where that goes. Yeah, and that's a really good point, too. When you are joining a community and messaging or starting to talk to people who aren't your friends, uh, it's often not the best strategy to just come out and offer to guest post or swap links or whatever. Um, it takes a little bit more time. You have to sort of build a rapport, build a relationship. It's much more of a sales process than it is uh, just asking for a link. So we are doing this strategy. It's the same idea. It's just talking to people who have blogs and people who are – close to us on the social interwebs. So if not our friends in our actual social networks, then maybe just people in in similar communities, but it's basically the same idea. Engaging with people via social media, asking who has a blog, and then just seeing if they want to guest post or uh, some free content. Your friends are really likely to say yes. Other people in different communities aren't as likely, but because you've already sort of made friends over social media, it's usually a lot easier. Um, so that's really cool. And then what I didn't know is that you had started trying to find some top blogs. So you mentioned that you looked at lists like top blog lists, so like top 50x blogs uh, or like top yeah. top lists of blogs in your market. How did that go? What did you think? And this was for finding big targets to try to post on, right? Yeah, exactly. And that was kind of cool, too, because when I've been doing, you know, my keyword research, I've been sticking to, like, DA20 blogs. And so kind of trying to get out of that um, specific market, it has been interesting, and i found a lot of new sites that I didn't even know about. Cool. And how's it going so far? Where, where are you at in that process? Um, so... Like, how many do I have? I have about 30 blogs with contact information. 30 blogs with contact information. That's awesome. That's a lot. And where do you yeah. think you are going to? I mean, did you find those by looking at top top lists? Yeah, for sure. So, and um, also, I would find some, some person would be 
we would have like a main blog and sorry, I'm trying not to say the topic because I keep finding I know, it on my tongue. I'm trying to pull it back. <laughs> <laughs> um, they would have a personal blog and so then I would go to their personal blog too. Cool, yeah. So you're actually quite a bit further than uh, you let on. You've got Ooh, yeah. probably five or or so blogs that you can guess post on with social media or that you found through friends and through your social networks. And then you have a list of 30 blogs with contact information that you can also start to email. Um, so overall, I'd say this is a pretty good start, even though you've basically just been doing you, – you've been splitting the time between content and link prospecting, right? Um, so obviously, 30 contacts isn't a ton of people. And conversion rates for outreach are always pretty low, around like 1% to 10%, usually around 5% is what you can expect. But we're trying to do these tactics because they tend to have a little bit of a higher conversion. So hopefully with these, we'll get five links. Uh, and if we're lucky, we'll even maybe get 10 links out of it, which is significantly higher than the average link building campaign for like broken link building or something like that. And 10 links is a really great start for any blog. So... Having done these two types of link prospecting, which is asking people you know, and trying to find top blogs to post on, I know you have some questions, and you uh, have been badgering me to answer them. And I had to say, no, Colleen. We have to learn together (laughs) with our readers. And so I haven't given you any answers. I've seen the questions, and I've kind of been thinking about them too. But um, why don't we go through those, and then I will provide some of the best answers that I can um, as it pertains to guest posting and where we are and what we can do. So uh, fire when ready. All right. So the first one is a lot of websites that I run into have the contact us form. And I know that you had mentioned it's best to find a private email address, but have you found that any of the con- contact us forms actually work for link building and talking to people? They do work. They're not ideal. So usually when you go try to find contact information, I like to think of stuff in terms of tiers. Like a tier one contact will be someone whose name and title you have and who controls the content of that website. Um, so it's somebody who might like the the best case scenario for us when we're looking for guest posts is to find an editor with their email and name who is like giving introductions to other guest posters on their site because you know that's the exact person that you want to talk to it's the person who's going to be posting the content you have their name and you have their email of course that's not going to happen every time right so if you can't find that, the next best thing is to find like a generic editor or a uh, marketing email or, or an editor or a marketing person with their name. Um, after that, just like a generic email or like a webmaster email, anything generic, which is obviously not as good, but somebody's going to be able to answer and you can track it in your email software, which we're going to talk about later. And then if you can't find any of those, you can use a contact form. And there are ways to use contact forms more efficiently. So there's a plugin for Chrome called Text Expander where you can create shortcuts so you don't have to copy and paste your whole template again and you don't have to write it all over. Um, but they do work and it's certainly worth just putting in your you know, email in there because why not? It takes like 10 seconds, right? So yeah, they do work. It's It's not ideal. And as much as you can, you want to shoot for the best case scenario, which is talking to an editor that you know interacts with the blog. But if you can't, just send whatever message you can, right? So, yeah, that's my answer for that one. Yeah, and then um, I would also, I know that one site I found said, you know, enter, enter your email address and you'll get a free ebook. And so I did that, and um, it looked like the guy's, the editor's email address because it was the same as the author. So I don't know if that would be a good process or not, or if that would typically work. That's tricky. Um, what you're doing there is you're signing up for somebody's email list and you're going to get all of the sales emails that they send. Um, so I would say that's not worth finding one email. Okay. 
unless you're going to use like a fake email generator or something. Um, but it's certainly creative. And if, if, if there's a site that you really, really want a guest post on, that might be a really awesome way to get an email on something that I hadn't thought of before. So, um, if there's a site that has like a, a super high DA or a high domain authority, then yeah, that might be a great way to get an email. Cool. I'll keep it in my back pocket. Yeah. Okay. Um, the next question is about building relationships and when do you bring in link building into the conversation? And you may touch on this later if you want me to skip it. Okay, yeah. What's the question? So do you think it's better to build a relationship with the contact contact that you want to link build with or cut straight to the chase and say, hey, let's guest post, baby? Yeah, that's tricky. I wouldn't call anybody baby. Um, <laughs> I was general. kidding. Yeah. <laughs> No, and the uh, the short answer is it depends on the site, and we'll cover this a little bit later. The long answer is that the more rapport you have with somebody, the more likely they are to accept your guest post idea, period. Um, however, some places and some people just don't want to take the time to interact with everybody who emails them, which is what complicates it. But that's something we'll talk about later for sure. Cool. Okay, next question, and this kind of plays off of what you just said. Do you have better luck with email or private messaging on Facebook? Uh, that also depends on the person and the market, right? So um, in my market, with with my site, it's a very active blogger market. A lot of people have personal blogs just for fun. They love Facebook messages, and I've had a lot of success connecting with people on Facebook. And some markets, they're just not on Facebook, like conservative political markets or, um, you know, if, say you have like a blog about diabetes, people don't want you like Facebook messaging them <laughs> about their diabetes blog, you know, like it's, uh, it's just kind of weird, right? So it depends on the market and some people expect emails, some people aren't on Facebook. So generally you would, you play it by ear for your market. I would say because it's more of a hobby, people will be much more receptive to talking over social media, whether that's Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or whatever. And you can try that with people who seem really active. But I think the general rule of thumb is contact people however you can. And if you don't have success contacting people via email, it's okay to reach out on social media. And sometimes what a lot of link builders like to do is to reach out on social media first, retweet something like a Facebook post, leave a nice comment and then email so that it's a little bit of a warmer lead, but really just play it by ear and reach people. However you can, I think is a general rule. Okay, cool. My next question is, is it okay to try to link build with sites that have merchandise, uh, non-blogs, you know, commercial blogs, or blogspot sites? Yes. Uh, you want links wherever you can with just a few exceptions. You don't want anything that is penalized. So if you type their brand name into Google, and this is just a rough, easy way to check to see if a site is penalized. If you type their brand into Google, uh, you want to see them pop up on the first page for sure. So if you type niche pursuits into Google, nichepursuits.com comes up on the first page uh, because it's a reputable site and Google likes it. If you were to type in nichepursuits.com into Google and it didn't come up, that's a bad sign. You don't want to be associated with that site. So that's, that's one exception, which is like spam sites. The other exception is like uh, social bookmarking sites. Those links don't count as links necessarily. There's some debate over this, and they can help in other ways, but they really don't count as links. So you kind of want to stay away from social bookmarking sites, and, uh, social aggregators. But any website that's like selling something or has a blog or has a links page, uh, yeah, that that that's fine. So like e-commerce sites, it's oh, it's totally fine to get a link from those sites. Manufacturers and merchandise sites, it's it's uh, great to get a link from those sites because they tend to be even more reputable in some cases. And stuff like Blogspot blogs are also fine. So you want to be careful with those because they're prone to spam. But with Blogspot blogs, um, every blog is technically a subdomain and each subdomain has its own authority in the eyes of Google. So um, it's it's fine to get a link from multiple blogspot blogs. There is some debate as to the power of those links. Um, some people say that they're not quite as powerful, but the general consensus is 
um, yeah, get the links wherever you can. Cool. Okay, I have two more questions. Sure. Um, should I only be focusing on high DA blogs? Does it hurt to do low DA blogs too, or are we trying to strategize with the high ones? Uh, that's a really good question, and it's a complicated answer. Maybe not a complicated answer, but complicated execution, right? So low DA blogs are fine. If you contacted a low DA blog or if you made a friend and you could get a link easily, it would 100% be worth it. That's probably what's going to happen when you're talking to your friends, right? Those blogs aren't going to be super high DA sites, but they're easy. And so it's worth going after that link because you don't have to do a whole bunch of work, right? Uh, also, if you're outreaching at scale, if you're sending hundreds and thousands or uh, hundreds and or thousands of emails, you generally just want to hit as many sites as you can that look relevant and quality and reputable, whether or not they have a high DA. For us, though, to start, we are trying to go after high quality links. And we don't want to have to send as many emails necessarily just getting started, right? It's also very true that one email, I'm sorry, one email, one really great link is worth a lot of lower quality links. One of my friends has a blog where he has just a handful of links. I think he has only like 30, 40 linking domains total. And But one of the, or I'm sorry, two of those links are from like, DA 90 something government sites and government sites are a lot more powerful. It made his DA just like skyrocket, right? So going after quality links is usually and, and, and spending more time on outreach for quality links can pay much bigger dividends in the end. So for us, the idea of asking your friends is to get easy links and the idea of going after 40 or 50 really high authority blogs is to get powerful links without having to send too many emails. And I think that's the best way. My gut tells me that's the best way to really get the link juice, quote unquote, flowing through your site. So take the links wherever you can, honestly. But we're going to spend more time and effort going after the higher DA blogs to start. They work smarter, not harder. Work smarter, not harder, and kicking things off, we want to try to get a few powerful links before we do anything else. Okay, that makes sense. We will do probably some other stuff where we go after more like lower medium tier blogs, which can work really well, especially if they're hyper relevant. And we'll probably do that with like with infographics and that sort of thing, where we will make a really specific infographic and we'll email blogs about it. Um, and we'll just try to email as many relevant blogs as we can. But yeah, we're going to go after big links to start. All right. Cool. All right. You ready for the last one for right. now? Okay. What is, is there a number that I should be trying to achieve each week, whether that's like a number of emails that I send or a number of responses? Do you have like a benchmark that you try to hit? Uh, well, I, I work in batches, right? So... I sat down to do link building, and I just sent as many emails as I possibly could. For you, you're also wrapping up content, so I think we won't necessarily send emails, and you have to figure out how many is doable for you, right? How many emails are you able to send without going insane? The number to keep in mind, though, is 5%. You can usually predict that around 5% of your emails will result in links if you're doing everything well. So maybe like 2 to 5%. So you can kind of see that to get 20 links, you have to uh, send between 500 and 1,000 emails, which is a lot, right? That's, uh, that's a couple weeks worth of work if you're doing maybe 50 a day or something. Um, so it's a grind, and that's why we're trying to work smart here at the beginning. We are trying to get links that don't require tons of emails, and it'll change as the campaign evolves. So as we start to scale the emails, we might be sending some more, and we might be using some other tactics, like maybe some tools that'll help us find contact information or whatever. And then... We might just try to send more per week. There's really no numbers, but I'm saying send as many as you can without going nuts and without tapping into resources you can't afford. So for us, we're probably going to start with like just 50, 
really highly targeted emails and spend a lot of time trying to follow up with those people. Uh, and after that, it'll probably increase a little bit. Cool. That makes sense. And I thought of one more, if it's okay if I ask it while we're going through questions. Yeah. So one of the things that I found on some of the bigger sites is that they have guest post pages. So I'm assuming that they have a lot of people that want to guest post. Um, is it okay to go ahead and go after those, or should I try to do that first through email? Yeah, there's no reason not to, and and we will talk about that a little bit later. If they're advertising or soliciting guest posts, the upside is they're open to guest posts, which is great. And you know that they enjoy guest posts, they're looking for them, so it's not going to be like out of the blue. They expect people to send them guest posts. The downside is these people get pitched all the time, uh, so you are going to be probably one of hundreds of people to send them something, and it could. And it's very possible that it will be a waste of time, especially if it's a bigger site. Um, so is it worth trying? Yeah. Is it worth writing a whole new guest post for each one of those just in case you get them? Probably not. So it's one of those things where you have to judge how much work will go into it. If you can just send them a couple of ideas and some writing samples, yeah, why not, right? That takes 30 seconds. If you have to write a whole guest post, those are the ones that I usually skip unless it's like a super highly relevant DA70 plus blog in my niche that I, I, I want to link on. Then, yeah. I will go after it with all of my energy. Okay, that makes sense. That's all the questions I have for now. Cool. All right, well, let's jump in. One of the things I wanted to do is because you had a little bit of trouble with the first tactic of asking people you know, it didn't quite find as many opportunities or result in as many opportunities as we figured it would, and that might be true for a lot of people, I wanted to give you another tactic to find a couple more opportunities because we want to send uh, 50 emails probably by the end of, not this week, but next week after that, right? So what I'm going to talk about is advanced queries. This is nothing new. A lot of people use advanced queries. Most agencies, when they go guest post, try to use advanced queries. Most guest posting services will be using advanced queries to find opportunities. The way they typically do that is finding those exact pages that you just mentioned, the guest posting soliciting pages, right? The pages that say write for us or guest post for us. Those are the way advanced queries are usually used. And I don't think that's the most optimal way. So I wanted to talk about how to use them the right way and give you a couple of queries to use yourself, Colleen, specifically, so that you can find some more opportunities and some more targets that you can sort of put in your contact sheet and uh, be ready to email in the next week, right? So um, the wrong way, and it's not really wrong, um, I've gotten links this way and they're they can be great links. It's just not optimal. And right now, we want to be as efficient as possible, right? So it's not wrong. It's just worse. Um, and that's to use advanced queries to find right for us pages or the pages that are looking for guest posts. Like I said, they do work. They can be good links. Um, the drawbacks are that some of these sites will be publishing lots of guest posts, mostly guest posts. And those sites tend to be spammier. They're much more likely to get penalized. They're typically not sites you want to be associated with. And it can be hard to spot. So that's one downside. Um, that kind of relates to the site quality and the conversion rate is, is the big downside. Because they have these really visible guest posting pages where they're asking for guest posts, um, the conversion rate will likely be a lot lower because they're just going to get so many pitches, especially from agencies who are outreaching and sending thousands and thousands of emails a day. That's the suboptimal way to do it. Uh, the right way to do it is to track down other guest posts on sites that may not necessarily be advertising them. Um, so instead of trying to find pages where sites are asking for guest posts, I like to find uh, guest posters or, or sites that are publishing guest posts that aren't asking for them explicitly. The advantages of this are that there's going to be fewer guest posts on the site. So it's going to make yours a little bit better. These audiences are typically higher quality. You know that they're not just trolling for free content. Um, so the site's usually higher quality. The major upside, of course, is the opposite of what I just said. 
the editors aren't going to be constantly pitched every single day. They're not going to be in a no mode necessarily. They're going to be much more likely to hear you out, see if your ideas are good, and um, hopefully accept you. Does that make sense so far? Yeah, it makes total sense. Okay, cool. So these are the queries I like to use. And if you don't know what an advanced query is, it's just a fancy thing to type into Google. There are lots of operators you can use, like in URL, in title, but simply putting these in quotes tend to work fine. What happens when you put something in quotes is uh, you are telling Google to look for all of those words together, right? So these are some simple ones. These should get you more opportunities than you, than you need, especially if you're using a broad keyword here. So what you want to do is type in your keyword and then in quotes, Guest post by, guest article by, my guest post, guest author, that sort of thing. So if you had a fitness blog, you just type in fitness, in quotes, guest post by. Or you might also type in running, weightlifting, yoga, guest post by. Whatever is broadly in your market where you want to find guest post, you type that in. And then you can just look at all of the results you're getting in Google. Maybe go five, six pages deep, see what comes up. And you're going to be looking for posts that are guest posts on sites that don't necessarily have right for us pages, which is really easy because sites that have rights for right for us pages, we usually have that like in their main menu, right? Um, so those are the ones you want to look for. And then after you find those, you want to try to find the editor. If they're publishing guest posts by other people, there's got to be a way to contact them, or when you use like a contact form, you can just say, point me to the person who's in charge of guest posts. Um, because they're used to doing this sort of thing, they're already doing it with other people. It's something within their business practice, so it's easier to just ask about. But a lot of times what you find with this is um, there will be an introduction by an, by an editor who's, who's saying something like, this is a guest post by Colleen Kinsey, or this is a guest article by by calling Kinsey and they'll have the um, link to their user account in the actual article and you can just click on that and most of the time for bigger sites you'll find an email there and if not you can use use tools like voila Norbert um, which I've written about elsewhere to sort of sniff out the email but the idea is to find sites that are publishing guest posts that don't advertise it necessarily you can see uh, the third one here is my guest posts. So the idea behind that is to find a person who has a list of their guest posts. Um, and that will obviously give you like a whole bunch of opportunities, right? Especially if you're writing similar stuff. So type those into Google, see what you find, use broad keywords and use a whole bunch of related broad keywords in your market. And you should have no trouble finding sites with these sorts of opportunities. What I also like to do is I turn on Mozbar, uh, which is a Chrome extension. We've talked about that and we've showed that a lot. Um, but if you turn on Mozbar while you are looking for these opportunities in the Google search results, you'll, you'll be able to see the DA of all the results as you search, which makes it a lot easier. Then reverse engineer and pitch. Find the editor and uh, send them your ideas however you can. Does that all make sense so far? Yeah, it does. So when you find the editor and you're emailing them, that's kind of where you're finding either how your markets overlap or just ideas that you have for articles, right? Yep. And so that's what's up to you when you send that email, finding ideas for content that will work on their site. And there are lots of ways to do that. See what they like to publish. See what they tend to publish on your market if it's a more general site. So maybe it's a fitness site and you have a yoga site. See what kind of yoga articles they publish and then pitch them similar ideas. Um, but the idea most of the time is just to pitch them ideas that you think would work well on their site. You want to do them a favor. You want to give them content that will make them some money. And uh, the best way to do that is just to look at what's already been successful. You can also just type their website into BuzzSumo and um, look at the most popular articles for their site. Lots of ways to do it, but the idea is to see what they like to publish, see what's worked for them, and then pitch them those ideas. Cool. Cool? Okay. So before you do that, you need to set up an outreach ecosystem, right? So it's certainly possible to just log into Gmail and start sending emails. Uh, that's totally fine, 
but we are probably going to end up sending many emails, and so we're going to have to keep track of them somehow. And we also want to be really efficient. We don't necessarily want to be like typing the message out every time, and we don't want to lose the data we have on people. So we have to set up what I'm going to call an outreach ecosystem before we even start sending emails if we really want to be efficient and be working smart. So what is an outreach ecosystem? There are lots of outreach tools. There are lots of outreach platforms. A lot of them do kind of the same stuff. I say an outreach ecosystem is anything that gives you a place to organize your emails, a tool that lets you use custom templates do you know what I mean by a custom template, Colleen? Yeah, so just kind of a pre-written email. A pre-written email usually that allows you to have text fields. So fields where you can say like name or if you want to mention a URL or if you want to put in the name of their site. Fields where you can just type in that information real quick for every person, right? Or even better, a tool that does it automatically. It's also a place to organize your follow-up. So follow-up is one of the most important things for outreach. Our rule of thumb, especially for these bigger sites that we want to contact, is to follow up with everybody at least three times, and you need a place to organize that. If nothing else, you want a platform that sends you a reminder to say, hey, follow up with this person. Uh, you also want to store and track relationships. So at the very least, you want to see the history of the emails that you sent to a given person on your list or whatever, or a given person inside your campaign. Plus all the follow-up and ideally maybe their social accounts or whatever. Um, but you need all these things in an outreach environment or ecosystem just to make it – just to have everything in one place, to make it easy to send lots of emails and to make it much more likely to get responses. And that's what outreach tools do. I can tell you from experience they make a massive difference uh, in the amount of work you do between those and like just sending an email in Gmail a hundred times, you know, it can be uh, just dozens of hours for one outreach campaign. So let's talk about how to set them up. Most of the time, the bulk of an outreach ecosystem is going to be made up with or made up of different tools. Okay. So there are three main tools that do most of this work that I tend to recommend to anybody doing outreach, and they're kind of in tiers, right? So the first one is Yesware plus Google Apps. You don't necessarily need Google Apps. If you don't use Google Apps, it's going to be totally free. The reason you use Google Apps is to have a branded email. So it would be calling Kinsey at your domain instead of calling Kinsey at Gmail. And... If you upgrade to Google Apps, it will increase your email sending limit. So by default with Gmail, you can only send 500 emails a day. If you sign up for Google Apps, which is $5 a month, you can send like 2,000 a day. And that's extremely hard to do, right? Uh, and then the other tool is Yesware. Yesware is an outreach tool, and I will put this in a blog post. I will just link to it. Um, but Yesware lets you do a lot of the stuff that we just talked about. You can have custom templates. It'll track uh, the relationship with a person. It will let you schedule emails to be sent later. So say, for example, if you want to send emails in the morning so that your email is on top of people's inboxes, you can do that. And it'll remind you to follow up with people in like an hour or a week or a day or whatever. And it's very cheap. So if you don't track emails... Yes, where it can be totally free, I think. I've been using the free version, and you can use it as much as you want. If you want to track emails, I think you can track 100 per month for free. If you want to pay for Yesware for just yourself, it's like $12 a month. Um, and, and Google Apps is $5 a month. Obviously a very cheap solution. That's what I'm using currently for my outreach. The main benefit also is that it integrates with Gmail. The other platform that I really like is BuzzStream. BuzzStream has a really steep learning curve, but it's one of the most scalable outreach systems. Uh, you can upload entire spreadsheets, and it'll send everything more or less automatically, which is really nice. It's, uh, it, it, it's not a one-click send, but you can send stuff really fast, which is cool. But 
there's much more of a learning curve. It can be kind of buggy. It's kind of a pain in the butt sometimes. If you do want to use that, it's $19 a month to send up to 500 emails, which I think is a little bit low, but you can get the limit increased. And the last one is PitchBox. So PitchBox is more of a manual outreach platform. You have to input the emails and send the emails individually, but it does have custom templates. The big benefit of PitchBox, the only reason I would pay $99 a month for this, and I'm not right now, but... Um, If you're out there and you have a little bit of money to spend and you want to do some outreach, PitchBox has one really cool feature that makes it super attractive to me and I want to try it at some point. I'm sorry, I want to use it more at some point. Uh, And that is automated follow-up sequences. So if you send an email off and you don't get an email back from somebody, it'll fire off a follow-up sequence. So you can write them beforehand and then it'll just send them every three business days or whatever if nobody responds. And that's a big benefit for pitch for pitchbox. Obviously, it's a little bit expensive or a little bit more expensive. $99 a month I think is their mid-level plan, but it's the only plan or it's it's where you first start being able to send automated follow-up sequences. Before that, it's just like any other one, right? So, these are the three I recommend. Um, and they all kind of have pros and cons. For noobs, I recommend Yesware. Um, you can integrate it with a Gmail account and you can do it 100% for free to start just to get your feet wet just to try it. Um, and then if you only get Google Apps, it's like five bucks a month. So super cheap. It's very easy. The main benefit is that it integrates with Gmail. So it's a, it's a system that most people are used to using, right? It's not some crazy software you have to go learn. All you have to do is just log into your Gmail account and use the, uh, uh Yesware features that appear there, right? So, very easy. It's probably what we are going to use. If you want to do outreach more at scale, BuzzStream is the way to go. So most of your ecosystem is going to be one of those tools or a combination of them, and you probably should pick at least one to start. Do you have any questions about that stuff, Colleen? No. I mean, I'm definitely going to get Yesware after we hang up the phone. Okay. Because <laughs> that sounds really cool. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and then... Google Apps would probably be good too. It's uh five bucks a month and you can send emails from Colleen at your domain.com, which is nice. It's I, I haven't seen any real conversion increase between that and like Gmail, but it can feel a little bit more professional and it can maybe help you connect with, with bigger sites. So if you've got an outreach ecosystem set up, what do you send? And the short answer is it depends on the site, right? I like to break these into two different sites, small blogs and big blogs. Small blogs are going to be blogs with low traffic, usually personal blogs that are run by like one person. For these types of sites, what I find works best is to make friends first and then pitch. Most small bloggers are coming out of the Blogspot era where everybody kind of had a personal blog. They were first flattered where people would ask to be on the blog roll or whatever and a lot of them just got abused by spammers because they were giving out links with no discretion these people don't like to be pitched they don't like you to solicit them they often feel like you're a jehovah's witness or something if you come knocking at the door asking for a link and i find that they tend to say no just as a knee-jerk response with these folks It's usually best to make friends first, and then, after they're your friend, pitch them something. In some cases, it's it's, it's even best to help them in some ways. Share their post, make a comment, link to them, whatever. Um, Give them something to make friends first. Then, after you have a rapport, make your pitch. The first email to these people should be like flattery. Tell them you're a fan. Ask them a question about a post. That usually works really well. Uh, What I didn't put in here is what I just said, which is like help them out in some way, share a post. Just ping them and say, hey, awesome post. I shared it on my Facebook. They'll love that, right? Comment on their blog. Anything else that starts a relationship where you can email them as a friend, right? Uh, Because the goal here is not to get a link first. The goal here is to actually make a real-life friend. So that's how I approach small blogs. And, you know, you have to make a call. Is it a small blog? Is it a big blog? There's going to be some gray area there. It doesn't matter 
either way for like single emails, you know, you're not going to destroy a whole campaign by approaching somebody the wrong way or anything. But generally, small blogs, you want to make friends first. For big sites, you want to do the opposite. When I think of big sites or when I say big sites, what I mean is a site that is big enough to support employees and in particular, a site who employs an editor or like a marketing director. These people are busy. This is not their personal passion project. They are paid to come into an office and answer emails and they get pitched all the time every day. They don't care about you. They most of the time don't necessarily care if you're friends or not. Um, they just want good free content, right? If they can get a super high quality article uh, for free, they look good. They're doing their job and uh, they'll be happy. So for these people, for big sites, for editors at big sites, your first email should let them know you've read the guidelines. You should pitch your ideas immediately after that, and you should avoid sending information about yourself most of the time. So, like, they don't care what you've done. They don't care how good of a writer you are. They don't necessarily even want to see your writing samples, although some will. You just want to let them know you've read the the guidelines, your email is written in English, has good grammar, and that you can pitch really good ideas. The biggest, most important part of this email, of course, is going to be... The ideas, they have to be really good. The titles have to be good. They have to be good ideas. They have to show that you've read the site. Um, But if you can do that, you'll either get a yes or no. So for these sites, you want to be more professional. You want to be snappier, and you want to pitch in the first email. Um, So that's pretty much the difference. And you can write any email that adheres to that sort of thing. A lot of people get obsessive over templates, Like, I want to go guest post. Like, what exactly do I send? What can I copy and paste that's going to get me a link? It doesn't work like that. Play it by ear. Personalize it to each blog if you think you need to. But in general, for small blogs, make friends first, then pitch. For big sites, pitch them professionally in the first email and make it really, really short, as as short as you can. Does that make sense, Colleen? Yeah, that makes sense. Short and sweet. Cool. So, do you have any questions, comments, thoughts about outreach ecosystems, uh, and or what you should actually be sending when you start contacting people? Nope, I think I got it. Um, Is there any sites that are too big that are out of reach? No. Or is it go big? Go big or go home, yeah. So um, I learned this, uh, not the hard way, but the fun way, I guess. So like my... My last guest post campaign, there's a big site in my market. It's a DA75. It's probably the biggest one in the space. It's a site where if you walk into a store, you'll see their magazines, you know? I was like, there's no way I would ever get a link on this site. And I sent the editor an email. I pitched my ideas in the first email. I was very friendly. Um, and I actually did try to make friends with her. I tried to build a rapport. I let her know that I've been reading her articles and that sort of thing. Uh, and then I followed up three times. I finally got an email back, and then it took I think fourteen emails back and forth before we settled on before we settled on an idea. That makes sense. Cool, man. At least you're hiding behind the computer, and they don't have to reject you to your face, right? That's right. And I've I've only gotten <laughs> one semi mean email in all of my outreach. I've sent thousands of emails. I've only had one person say something like no and don't email me again it's like okay fine most people are super nice even when they reject you and it's not a big deal at all so the assignment was written before we knew that you still had some content to do so the first assignment was going to be send 50 emails this week i think we should change that to just get 50 good contacts ready to email right so or Maybe we should change it to line up the guest post with any friends that you can, get a yes from them, and then have 50 emails, addresses, ready to send next week. Does that make sense? Yes, and get all my content done. Get all your content done, and probably we want to figure out what we would be linking to. 
in, in, in our case, that's going to be that pillar post. So we have one keyword that we really like. Seems very low competition, has a really high search volume. We probably want to finish that article and have it linkable, right? So an example might be like, if you were a fitness blog and you had a really good weightlifting keyword, you would want an article or you, you would want that article finished so that when you pitch ideas, you can pitch them around potential guest posts in which it would make sense to link back to that pillar article. So you would pitch weightlifting ideas. So in those guest posts, you could link back to your weightlifting article. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I may run some by you. Yep, 100%. After the call. 100%, yeah. Cool. So um, finish the pillar post, if nothing else. So we've got this content coming in. Uh, we are nearing the finish line, but we also want to finish the pillar post with our really amazing golden nugget keyword that we found um, so that we can structure our pitches around that keyword. Um, and then we want to get a yes from anybody, from it, from any of our friends that we can and then we want to have 50 email addresses we can start emailing next week. Work for you? Awesome. Okay, works for me. Cool. Do you have any other parting thoughts? Um, nope. <laughs> Think about me when I quit my job on Thursday. Yeah, <laughs> that's going to be super exciting. Next time we talk to you, you will be uh, just close Unemployed. To yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Colleen. Uh, thanks for tuning in, and we will talk to you next week. See ya.